All right, on the board, we're going to have the verses we're going to read together today. It's going to be two. It's going to be Matthew 22. We're going to read 37 and 38. And so if you look at the top line, 37 is right there at the end of it. And uh, I will start us and we will read together. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. This is the word of God. Praise be his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and first of all, we would just praise you and pray that, Holy Spirit, you might fill us with your wonder this morning and with who you are. And as we think about how we live out our Christian lives, I pray that we would be informed by your word and Holy Spirit, that we would be empowered by you to live in intimate knowledge of who you are. And we pray for all of those who are hearing this morning, for those who are gathered together to worship you, for those who are listening online. We pray especially for those this morning who are sick, who are not able to be with us. We pray that you would be with them and those who are traveling. And we pray again now that you might just grant to us that we would see you in your glory and that we would worship you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, there are four texts before us this morning. and I'm going to ask you to do this. Um, we've already read from the first. Romans 13, 10 uh, is like the first in that it says that uh, the law and, and, and that in loving each other, we have the fulfillment of the law. And then I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 5. And for those of you who are like me, who have um, page Bibles, I want you to somehow mark your place there and then turn to 1 John chapter 4. I'm sure that for those of you who use your phones, uh, that'll be pretty easy to put them side by side. Uh, but for the rest of us, we will just struggle and hold our place. Okay which is hard when you want to talk with your hands and hold this place at the same time, but I'm going to try to do that just for a second. Um, maybe I'll mark it. That'll work better. Okay. So, some of you, when you were in high school, uh, I know that, uh, where, where Brenda taught at Houston County that they would teach this in their literature course. I don't know what grades it was, but they would teach Jonathan Edwards. And when they teach Jonathan Edwards in high school, what sermon do you think they're going to use? Sinners in the hands of an angry God, exactly. And so everybody leaves, and, and many of the instructors, they want to paint Edwards in a bad light, that Edwards was this uh, very stern uh, Puritan, and that he preached, uh, you know, the, the threat of hell and and he preached about hell and all of this. And so everybody leaves thinking, that Jonathan Edwards, he, that was a mean preacher. And I want to tell you something. For those of you who have read Jonathan Edwards, you know what I'm going to tell you is true. Jonathan Edwards was anything but a mean preacher. Jonathan Edwards was not only a service to the people and a blessing to the people from God that he taught, but he was a blessing to the nation as the nation went through what was called the First Great Awakening. And Jonathan Edwards' greatest contribution, I think, to the church has been the fact that he was a man who taught about loving God. He taught about the love of God, and he taught about a soul that was in love with God. And his readings... If you, if you were to take one, maybe uh, I would say the affections would be probably my top. But the, a, a mind for God is also another, but there, there are just so many good uh, meditations from Jonathan Edwards on loving God. And the last song that we sang this morning, I, I think uh, Jonathan Edwards would have enjoyed a great deal, and it also uh, kind of goes parallel to the message that we're going to be looking at today as well. So here's the thesis of today's message. Christian ethics 
properly understood and applied are founded in the love of God. Now, Dan read for us this morning from the first commandment in Exodus. And in that commandment, you hear that we are to love the Lord. And it's also repeated in what's called the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And he says at the end of that first one, he says, for those, I'm going to bless those who love me and keep my commandments. But here is the problem. We talked about this when we started ethics from the Old Testament. The people of Israel did not love God, and they did not keep his commandments. They went into idolatry. They went into uh, syncretism of religions with their neighbors. And they did anything but love God. So the prophets foretold of a time when the people of God, when God was going to make a new covenant with them, and that he was going to put his, the, the knowledge of him and his spirit, his life, in their hearts. And he was going to change their hearts from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. And that's exactly what is necessary, as we will see this morning, for the Christian ethic. We need to understand the dynamic of this love is the highest quest of our lives as believers, the love of God. Now, in this message, we're going to ask two basic sets of questions in order to understand or get at an understanding of the great truth of God's love. The first set of questions we're going to ask is this, who and why? Who and why? The sub-question is this. So the first thing is in your outline. Is this love that we're talking about the love of God or for God? Is it the love of God which would make us the objects? So we're talking about how that God loves, or we talk about the three great loves and, and loving God. When we speak of loving God, do we mean our love for God with God as the object? Well, the answer to that is yes. It's a both and. It is both. But now let me say this. The basic fact of Christian ethics and living the Christian life is that our thoughts, the fountainhead of our thoughts and actions is to be obedient love. To state Jesus positively, he says this, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So obedient love is, is our response to the love of God. That's exactly how it happens. And that's what I'm going to unfold now as we think about the love of God and the, our love for God. So first of all, Let's think about this from Romans chapter 5, verse 5, when we think about the love of God. This hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, if you look at Romans chapter 5 and the verses that I've given you, he says, just to give you a quick summary, that we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God. That doesn't simply mean that we have, uh, that there's no strife between us and God. It means that we have the shalom of God. We have his presence in us. So we have obtained our introduction to God by faith into this grace, and we stand in this, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope, here's our verse, does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, note that. The love of God has been poured out within us through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. That is the, the linchpin of this entire section. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
for one would hardly die for a righteous man, that's Aristotle, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we have, go down to verse 10, we have been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So all of this, this reconciliation and this peace that we have with God, the ability to rejoice in Him, the ability to endure tribulations, all of these things have been poured out into us by the love of God. Now, let's think next of all about 1 John chapter 4. And again, a key verse in this passage is going to be... Uh, he has the whole thing up here, but, well, let, let me give you this. One more thought from Paul. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. Do you see the, the cycle, how this works in the love of God? We love him because we are known by him. Known doesn't mean he is cognizant of us it means that he loves us and has an intimate relationship with us so now look at first john chapter 4 and i want to start at verse 15 okay whoever confesses that jesus is the son of god god abides in him and he in god okay we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love, or by this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because the fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Now note this, here's the key verse here. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For who is the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now I want to show you this chart and maybe help us get our minds around how this works out in our lives. So you see the first arrow. The first arrow goes from God to man. And this is in what we're going to call initiating love. God always, the love of God and the love that we have is always initiated from God. We don't start anything. He's the one who loves us first. That's what John says. We love him because he first loved us. So we have this initiating love. Now, in response, God does something in that initiating love that we're going to talk about in just a moment, and that is regeneration. God causes us to become alive to him, to, to be able to know him to be able to love him and so from his love for us now we love him and that love is demonstrated in our response now many of these are what we would call fruits of the spirit faith humility obedience obedience and trust to me are are the the two sides of the same coin if we trust we obey reliance gratitude thankfulness glorifying God in every way that we can and of course that neighborly love so these are demonstrations that God has loved us that we love God and we live this out in our lives does that make sense to you that's that's how it works that's that's what the Bible 
teaches. So this reciprocity of man's love for God depends on two essential ingredients. Let's just sum it up. Two essential ingredients. Number one, God's initial love for us. Number two, regeneration. So that you cannot live out Christian ethics. Now, you can be a virtuous person. You can have ethics. I wish more people had ethics, don't you? You can have ethics, you can have virtue, but you cannot live Christian ethics unless you are a Christian because you do not have the Spirit of God. Paul Ramsey sums it up like this. He says, Christian love for God depends altogether on God's love for man in the Word made flesh in Christ. Him we love in loving God. Through him alone we love God. And upon God's grace, reintegrating the individual. I love that statement. His grace reintegrating the individual causes our will so that for the first time, a person, listen to this, may resolutely and thoroughly love you can't love God. Go back to what Paul says in chapter 5. If there's not reconciliation between you and God, you can't love God. Because there's going, to be, there's going to be either guilt or animosity. There's going to be some reason, God, you have kicked me out of the garden, and I'm trying to get back in, and you keep me at arm's length. God, I don't even like you. Like Luther said, love God, I hate God. And then he said, I felt my soul strangely warmed as he read from Romans chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, especially 17. You remember in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah sees the vision of God, and he says, wow, this is great. <laughs> I deserve to be here. Right? Isn't that what he said? I should be here. After all, look who I am. I'm Isaiah. No, he didn't say that. He says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I live among people of unclean lips. I am undone. You know what that word literally means there? It means I am disintegrating. I am coming apart. It's chaos. The center cannot hold. Notice what the, the Ramsey's language is here. He says God reintegrates us. I love that. He reintegrates us. We are, we are spiritually broken. We are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sin. And what does God do? In regeneration, he reintegrates us into a whole person, a justified person who can now stand before God righteous in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We know God through Christ. And now we can love Him because of what He has done. No wonder we can be grateful. No wonder we obey because the Spirit of God is alive in us. And that's what it means to live in this love of God, the love that we have from God and the love that we have for God because we are regenerated and we can set our minds and our affections on Him. And by the way, the name of the essay I was trying to think about by Edwards is Religious Affections. Religious, I said affections, it's religious affections. So now let's move on to the second thing, the second set of questions, how and what. And now we're really going to focus on some of the thoughts from Edwards. First of all, how can we show our love for God? Now, when you look at the scriptures, you look at what Jesus said, when Jesus said, okay, what's the greatest commandment that you love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul? And then he said, and the second is this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says in Romans 13, 10, again, that the, the fulfillment of the law is this, is that we love our neighbors. So every time we see in the New Testament, it talks about God's love for us. 
And our love for God, many, many times, is expressed in how we love on a horizontal plane, how we love and help others. Now, again, as I said two weeks ago, we must love and help others, not in a, uh, an unwise way. You know, a lot of times people will ask you to help them, and if you do what they ask you to do, you're not going to help them, you're going to hurt them. So we have to be wise. The, 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 the whole thing about neighborly love is our disposition that we will actively engage, that we willingly, that we want to really help people. But that doesn't mean that you, that again, that you're going to, you know, fall for every scam that comes along. But you'll be discerning and open I think openness is the key to help so part of our love is again this horizontal love however it's not just horizontal love because if you begin to think that the you know the only way that I show my love for God is in what I do then I think before long you'll be part of the social gospel You'll be part of the crowd that says, well, you know, we just need to go out and, and help people and be involved in this cause and that cause, and that's how we show our love for God. That is not the key. It's not the, I would say even this, I would say that is an ancillary of our love for God, that because God has loved us, he has poured his love into us, certainly we're going to love our neighbors. And I was reading one guy, it was Richard Mao, and he said, you know, the Christian is like the state in a sense. We have two kinds of, of loves. You know, in our, in our government, we have domestic affairs and foreign affairs, right? So the Christian has domestic affairs and foreign affairs. In domestic affairs, in our domestic love, we love each other in the church. We love our fellow believers as, as the New Testament enjoins us to commands us to to love each other but then we also have our foreign policy as well and that is that we're that we're to love the strangers that we're to love unbelievers and not just in a manipulative love to get them to do what we want them to do but in a genuine love that will build them up and help them and be discerning but again at the end of the day when you get to heaven you are not going to be witnessing to people. You are not going to be giving to causes. You are not going to be helping people who are in trouble. You're not going to be doing any of that when you get to heaven. You ever thought about that? You know, when you stand at the ocean and you think about how small I am and how large the ocean is, and you get this sense of your finite nature well you know this life compared to the life to come is is a vapor the bible says now what you do in this life is very important as far as the life to come it's extremely important we can't undersell that can we but i'm saying this in your life to come that life is life without end and in that life, you are going to spend eternity loving, coming to know more and more about God, and worshiping God. So I think in this life, if it's going to be the most important thing then, it ought to be the most important thing now, and that everything else I do should come out of that. We're going to call this the mystical sense in the way we love God. And again, Edwards helps us a great deal here. We are to love God for, and I'll explain this word in a moment, the complacency of our soul. In your program today, there's a quote from Jonathan Edwards, and I just want to read this quote and just, just kind of hit a few high points with you on the quote. 
He says it was from his, that is God's value, for God's eternal glorious perfection of wisdom, righteousness, and that he valued the proper exercise and effect of these perfections in wise and righteous acts and effects. Let's just stop there. So this is what he's saying. God knows who God is. He has no false illusions. God cannot hold a false thought. Everything God knows is reality, and God knows who he is. He knows of his perfections. He knows of his glories and his delights, and these things exist in the Trinity. Now, from this value he calls infinite value, the infinite value for his internal glory and fullness, he valued the thing itself. He values his own glory. He values his own fullness. He values his own perfections. You say, well, God is a massive egotist. No, he's not. Egotists are people who value things they don't possess that are not really true about them. God is God. If he didn't value them, he would not have created. Now think about that. Had God not valued these things, he would not have created because these things he communicated, which is something of the same excellent in the creature. So God, out of this fullness and out of this infinite value, creates. He creates the heavenly creatures and the angels. All of these things that they might share this infinite glory. Now, he doesn't give them God-likeness. He's not making little gods. But he is sharing what is called incommunicable attributes. They can never be God, but they can have attributes like God, just like we when we love. Thus, because, and then he made man, and he made man in his own image. Thus, because he infinitely values his own glory, consisting in the knowledge of himself and complacence. There's that word complacence. Now let's look at the definition. It is satisfaction and delight and joy in himself. God has ultimate satisfaction, ultimate delight, ultimate joy in himself, and he has communicated this. So he delights in the knowledge, the love, and joy of the creature as being himself the object of this knowledge, love, and complacence. Oh, beloved, what a thought. That God communicates to us. Would you say that God is... is is a beautiful being rich in wisdom and knowledge and, and glory. All of these things he communicates to us. That's what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be ever knowing, ever learning, ever coming to more and more intimate knowledge of who God is and enjoying him more. The confession says it best. The chief end of man is to know God and to enjoy Him and glorify Him forever. Oh, beloved, to know God is to enjoy God, to enjoy His perfections, to enjoy communications with Him, to know Him. So he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind a mind in love with God will cherish God's perfections will cherish his holiness his love a mind in love with God will dedicate itself to knowing and believing what is true about God and the mind in love with God will seek a greater and greater vision of God and the greater your vision of God the greater your satisfaction in him 
I spoke a few weeks ago about self-love. And self-love is a fact. We all have it. And self-love, I want to tell you something, can be good. Do you know, I was reading this and I had not thought about this before. Do you know why the Bible speaks to us in its warnings, in its promises, in all the ways? You, you know why we like that? Because we have self-love. If you love yourself, you don't want to be punished, especially eternally. If you love yourself, you want to delight in promises. So let's just, let's just make a slight, let's, let's just make a difference here. It's not a slight difference, it's a huge difference about self-love. What is bad self-love? Bad self-love is when it is for private interest alone. When it's all about me, and you'd call that selfishness. And then I think there's a neutral self-love, and I think unbelievers can have this neutral self-love, and that is when, through love of self, we, we do value others, especially people that are likable, and you know, some people are more likable than others to, to different people. It's hard to explain that, but it's kind of like what Aristotle goes back to, you know, you, you, you like people that you like, your friends and all the rest, and you do things for them. So this neutral self-love realizes value in other people, and it, it gives itself for their benefit, but ultimately it does come back to the self. But then the positive self-love is this. There is a positive self-love. And that is the self that is disinterested in private gain, but is interested in knowing God. Piper calls that Christian hedonism. Knowing God, the more you know God, the more joy you have. And isn't that what you want? We want joy, we want happiness, we want to be fulfilled, we want to be satisfied, we want to be at peace. Remember what John, John said just a few moments ago? He said, perfect love doesn't fear. Well, how does it not fear? Because it has reconciliation with God, Paul says. You see how Paul and John go together? This love of God is the greatest thing that we can have in our Christian life. And then our ethics flow. It's the fountainhead of our ethics. And what does that look like? The second part of the question. Well, Paul tells us in Romans, and I'll just go back through it, just bullet points. He says we have peace. Peace with God. That means that we are satisfied in Him. Not simply that we're not afraid anymore, that we are satisfied in Him, that we find our delight in Him. We rejoice, we hope, we love, we glorify God, we enjoy. Look at Romans 8 and verse 28 and verses 30 and 39. Enjoying God. So here are the truths that we experience. First of all, Christian ethics is grounded in the believer's experience of God's love. You can't really know love until the love of God has been poured into your heart. Now again, human beings are made in the image of God, and, and human beings love and love all kinds of things. And all kinds of people. But to, to love like God loves, and to have neighbor love and obedient love, comes from the love of God. Secondly, Christian ethics is revealed by our reciprocating to others the love we know from God. Again, John asks the question, how can you say you love God whom you've not seen if you don't love your neighbors who you have seen? Your brothers whom you've seen, he says. So our love, this genuine love, is reflected because, beloved, it's not something I have to gin up. If I have to tell myself that I need to love my neighbor... And, and work up to that, then something's missing. But if I know that this is true of me, that I genuinely do love my neighbor, and I need to stop grieving the Holy Spirit and just, just let myself be a neighborly person, that's different. And finally, the vision of God's glory 
and our enjoyment of God makes Christian ethics an organic response, a natural response to the challenges that we face in times of moral conflicts and ethical questions. So the love of God is the fountainhead of everything. And beloved, God has shared his love in your hearts. God has done all things. I love what he says in Romans chapter 8. He has, he has done all things for us. All things. He's poured his love into us. So what kind of men and women ought we to be? Let's stand for prayer. Oh Lord, we come before you this morning and truly the highest thing we can consider, the most blessed thing, the most blessed person, the most blessed pursuit is to pursue you with our minds, to read and enjoy your word, to meditate over it, to think about, Lord, how you've blessed us, to be seated in heavenly places, to think back over the blessings of our lives, especially the spiritual blessings that you brought to us that we, that we know you to start with, that we love you, that we, that we love to hear your word proclaimed, that we, we love to see people come to know you. We, we love to see our brothers and sisters grow in Christ, that these things give us, as Edward said, complacency, not not a status quo, but a, a sense of delight and joy. These are the things that delight us. Delights us to see your name made much of. Delights us to see your word explained and, and to have it burn within our hearts. All of these things delight us and, and help us to understand that our love for you it's not just expressed in loving others, even though it is, but is also expressed in our loving you directly, spiritually, and again with our minds and the core of our being, our hearts. So Holy Spirit, we would ask you this morning to encourage us, and draw us and lead us and empower us and enable us that we might pursue, first of all, the knowledge of God. Lord, let our love for you burn in our hearts. And then we know that our hearts will also desire to live for your glory, to live with humility, to live with faith, and, and, and to be virtuous. These will be things that we will want to do because of who we are in you. And to see our neighbors flourish. These are all things that we rejoice in. As Paul said, give us hearts that weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And most of all, may our vision of you grow brighter and brighter and warmer and warmer as we pass through this life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.